Electricast. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to the Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, I'm the founder, and my mission is to help ethical entrepreneurs and holistic healers to find their voice through spiritual coaching and podcasting. I'm honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through healing, kindness, innovation, purpose, and spirit. Understanding that to create collective change, we need to be the change. It all begins with us. Renee Yomtob is a mental performance coach from Idaho who overcame narcolepsy and now helps others to get unstuck let go of limiting beliefs, and to become more conscious of their patterns and behaviours. Change can happen in an instant, and it starts with you. Renee is a joy to hang out with and is an inspiration to everyone to embrace the power of your mind. Welcome, Renee, to The Ethical Evolution. Thank you, Bindi. Happy to be here. Now, you're joining us all the way from Idaho uh, in the States. For those people who don't know who you are and what you do, can you go ahead and tell us? Yes. My name is Renee Yomtob, and I am a mental performance coach, hope, helping folks get past their blockages, their stuck points, so that they can really thrive in whatever that is. Now, now you love getting people unstuck which I love also. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, mental performance is one thing. Mental health is another. Where do the two intersect for you? Mm, I love that question. I think mental health, to me, both of the intersection is the relationship you have with yourself. When we hear the word mental health kind of talked about in society and the media, you know, it's a big buzzword and it has been, which I think is great because the pendulum swing, mm. you know, before it was like, don't talk about mental health. <laughs> and now we talk about it all the time. And I think it really can come back to what is our relationship with ourself, our thoughts, our emotions that arise. And that's also similar in mental performance. You know, in order for us to perform at our highest, we need to also detach from a lot of the stories that we tell ourselves, be able to see the thoughts as they pass by like clouds in the sky. So to me, the the intersection of both of them is what is our relationship to ourself. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, not a lot of people think about mental performance. They, they, just, they just want to get through the day uh, most of the time. Um, but when we're really firing on, on all cylinders mentally, we can do incredible things, can't we? Yes. Mm. We people are so cool in their capacity and the resources that lie within them. And sometimes they just need a little flashlight to help find them. You know, sometimes, like you mentioned, we just try to get through the day or we're in the same routines or we have these blinders on and we can't see that we're actually not in a dark room with no windows <laughs> and no <laughs> doors, but we're actually full of windows and skylights and beautiful doors that open. And sometimes we just need help seeing them. Mm. And, you know, there'd be, like you say, people get stuck in the stories they tell themselves you know, and, and we have behaviours and patterns and that we go through every day, which is like, oh, well, I do this every day, so I just keep doing it and, you know, I don't break my pattern. Um, but it is about breaking those patterns and actually finding new pathways, isn't it? Yes, yes, it, it, really, <laughs> it really is. Sometimes we can't even see where our stuck points are, where our patterns are because – we're in the driver's seat, you know, so there's, there's all these different tools and things we can do on our own to help us kind of get a bird's eye view, zoom out a little bit so that we can first identify what patterns we have, you know, bring awareness to that. So then we can change it. You know, we can't really change anything until we see truly without judgment where we are today. Mm, the without you, judgment part is very, yeah, <laughs> very important. Hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I think a lot of us 
you know, we bring our emotion and part of our story and part of our negative self-talk spiral into it. So it's not necessarily like, okay, I'm right here in life. So what can I do to change it? Oftentimes I hear with clients and students, people say, okay, here's where I am in life. And that means that I really suck and I'm lazy and I can't make any changes. And so now you're trying to, you're not making any (laughs) movement from this point. You're making movement from like, five steps back because you just beat yourself up. And now to try to overcorrect that, it's a lot bigger of a hurdle to overcome. Mm. So do you, to get people unstuck in those sort of patterns and pathways, do you ask them the curious questions that they're not asking themselves? So like, you know, so what if you didn't do that? Or what if you thought about it in this way? Or what if you tried this? So how do you bring those curious questions through to people to get them to see a whole different way of things? I really, I think the the theme of a lot of the questions is curiosity. You know, can we approach our problems, our thoughts, our emotions with curiosity? Because then we can really dive into them and explore them in a way that we might not be able to if we come at it with fact. So a lot of the questions I do ask are the what ifs, you know, and different perspectives. And can this thing that means something really upsetting to you, can it actually mean something totally different? Uh, And then asking a lot of the questions that might be kind of hard, you know, a lot of the clients I see, a lot of the students that come to our programs, they have something called a secondary gain, which is a sneaky little thing (laughs) that is running at the unconscious level. So our unconscious mind is like this little toddler that's driving the ship. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So if consciously we want something like consciously, I want to be so successful and I want to be really healthy and I want to have a loving relationship, but unconsciously, maybe I have a belief from way back in the day that like, I actually don't deserve success or I don't deserve to be loved, or maybe I have a fear that once I get in a relationship, they're going to hurt me. Or once I find success, uh, everyone in my life is going to leave because success means that I'm greedy or I'm evil or bad. And so we have these like sneaky little beliefs that are actually affecting our behaviors and our ability to get that thing that we consciously want. And so a lot of the questions I ask have to do with what is this unconscious thing that's really driving the ship, driving your behaviors and your actions and your attitudes. Mm. So underneath all of that, there's there's two things there, you know, consciousness being one and beliefs being the other. So, you know, (laughs) there's so many people who go through life in autopilot, they don't even hear what the self-talk is in their head. And so it is just the same stuff that they're putting themselves down, they're, they're saying the worst things to themselves that nobody else would ever have the guts to say. And then at the same time, they're not even conscious that they're doing it. So they're just like accepting that this is all there is and I can't change it. But the truth is you can, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> you can change it. I think some of the things I'm passionate about and the truths that I so hold to be true is change can happen in an instant and you can do things that you can't even comprehend, like or not even in your awareness. And all of that happens and starts with you, your openness, your willingness to change or seek help or try something new. You know, I found this work through a training I took when I personally was at my lowest, lowest point. I was dealing with a neurological disease called narcolepsy that doctors told me I'd have forever. Narcolepsy is, uh, for those that don't know, it's a 24-hour disease. I was told that my brain didn't produce this chemical that would tell my brain when it was time to be awake. Mm. And so... uh, kind of like those fainting goats that went viral, (laughs) you know, a little bit where they would like be so excited and then just like pass out. That's one of the forms of narcolepsy. And so I, for a few years, have been trying to do anything under the sun to just feel a little bit better. Because if you can imagine not getting sleep, I was feeling anxious and depressed and it was affecting all sort of the mental health Mm -hmm. (laughs) gambit. Mm -hmm. One thing. And Um, I had found this training 
when I found a whole new low, (laughs) my low point being, I just, I'm not anxious or depressed. I just care. I don't care. I don't care about anything. I don't care about my friends. I don't care about my future. I don't care about my partner. (laughs) Just like so detached from life. And day one of this training, one of the trainers got up on stage and said, 99% of disease is psychosomatic, meaning it starts in the brain and then it manifests to physical symptoms that we then feel. And I was sitting there, Bindi, and I was like, you're probably right. 99% (laughs) of disease is probably psychosomatic and narcolepsy is probably the 1%. Mm. (laughs) You know, I was like, narcolepsy is real. Like I was just holding on white knuckling this And as they're continuing to talk, like I'm getting more and more defensive, like wanting my disease to be the real one. And I, I hit a point in the training where I realized, okay, Renee, you can either be right, or you can feel better. Mm -hmm. Like in this particular moment, both can exist at the same time. So I figured the worst that happens is I'm right back where I started. The best that happens is this guy from stage is right. (laughs) And I can clear up this disease with my mind. And so that's what I did. And after that first day, I'm talking maybe eight hours of training that night, all of my symptoms went away. No. Yes. (sighs) So that night I, and these, these, this is going to seem like such little stuff, but to me, it was huge that night. I, after the training, I went to dinner with friends. We got back at like 10, 11 PM. I had so much energy That next morning, I woke up at 5 a.m., did a workout, did another 8 to 10 hours of training, had dinner with friends, studied when I got home, went to bed, woke up at 5, had enough energy for a workout, like no naps, no falling asleep during the day, like truly symptom-free. And it's been like that since. That is incredible. Humans are incredible. (laughs) And so I think it starts with, somebody seeking and being open, you know, because if I would have sat there with my arms crossed, like holding on to this disease that I so wanted it to be real, then I wouldn't have experienced any change. Mm. Mm. So really being open and continuing to seek out and uh, yeah, ask the right questions. And it just goes to show how strong um, and how powerful belief systems are, you know, like you wanted to believe that was real and you wanted to hang on to that. But the minute you let go of it, Look at what happened. I know. We really, a lot of our beliefs, our unconscious beliefs, they're there because they think that it's protecting us. Like our unconscious mind thinks it's protecting us. So this little secondary sneaky gain of mine at that time was that I had such a big fear of failure. Mm -hmm. Like I was you know, did decent in school. I was a competitive athlete my whole life, a college athlete. Like I just, I had a huge (laughs) fear of failing. And so as long as my disease was real, if I didn't accomplish all that stuff I set up for, it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Like I have this disease, Mm -hmm. you know? So it was kind of in a sneaky, (laughs) sick way, this belief was keeping me safe from Mm -hmm. the hurt, the potential shame, the whatever comes with failing. And so you... Harper hits one in the air, left back, it goes! Harper, the swing of his life! MLB playoffs are near, and you know what that means, Alex? Yep, Flippin' Bats will be staying up late and having all the fun. From breaking down the most important stories and games, nobody's done what he's doing. Nobody, not even Babe Ruth. To interviewing baseball's biggest stars. I felt like I was pitching more stress. I was trying to be so perfect. No one covers America's pastime like us. So as we sprint towards this year's World Series on Fox, please make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe to Flippin' Bats with Ben Verlander and me, Alex Curry. Baseball is fun, and so are we. We're going to have fun, dang it. We'll talk to you soon. have to just, I guess, be ready to face what comes and know you can adapt. You know, a lot of the stuff I see with my clients is they'll want to hold on to this belief, this fear, this guilt, this heavy emotion that's dictating their life because they've held on to it for so long. They don't know who they are without it. 
Mm. And that can almost be scary to go into the unknown of like, who am I without this thing I've identified with? That's exactly it. And I was just chatting to someone um, just just an hour ago, um, who, who is a, a spiritual healer and, um, helps people through addiction. And, um, you know, one of the things she said is, well, who are you without your story? You know, like if, if we let go of the story, who are we without all of that? Let all of that go, let all of the, and it's like, you know, we build these walls for ourselves and the minute you can strip them away, like, and I, I would imagine that when you're asking those curious questions of people, that you're getting incredible breakthrough moments and big ahas where they're just going, oh, right. Yeah. I've been the problem all along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so beautiful to see that little light bulb, you know, and my favorite part is when people forget who they never were, you know, they forget that the stuckness they were in, they can no longer associate with that feeling anymore. They're like, are you kidding? Did I say that? Like, no, I love myself. I would never say I hate myself, (laughs) you know, or like, no, I talk happy to myself all the time. What are you talking about? And that's just the best part. And there's probably people listening, Renee, that are going, that's all well and good. But how do I stop falling back into the old patterns? How do you stop from going back into the old patterns? There's so many different things to do. The way that I start with all my clients is doing this technique called mental emotional release. It's a really big one. It's uh, It was clinically researched in comparison to cognitive behavioral therapy. And the results are pretty astonishing and we release anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, any of those sticky, yucky beliefs. We release them from your mind and then they're, they're gone. (laughs) Like they're gone as long as this is the caveat, as long as you have, you have something you're working toward you. So you're continuing to take action toward your future goal and you manage your mindset along the way. So one of the examples I like to give is if I, let's say I'm like, I want to lose a hundred pounds and then I lose like 20 pounds and, um, and I have two options, right? I can either go into an old pattern where I'm like, uh, I have to go buy new clothes because my clothes don't fit. This really sucks. I really don't want to be doing this. And then your unconscious mind hears, oh, you don't like this? Okay, don't worry. We'll just put that 20 back on. You won't have to deal with this like problem and then we'll all be good. (laughs) So you can manage your mindset along the way and celebrate every point of success you see for yourself. Manage your mindset because the more success you train yourself to see, the more success you'll find. Yeah, and that's it. We can either be our biggest advocate or our biggest enemy, can't we? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we usually are our biggest enemy. <laughs> yeah, we're good at that one. <laughs> we're so good, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with the work that you do with people, what kind of results are you seeing in transformation are you seeing in people who are actually trying these techniques? So much. It really warms my heart. I work with people in one area of life. It trickles down into everything, but I've seen people no longer identify with like these unspeakable traumas that they had maybe growing up, you know, and now they're like, oh, I actually forgive this person and that situation. And like, I have love for them. And now I'm no longer affected by this because it's all cleared up. All I see is my future. I'm no longer living in the past or what that means about me. I've seen people become like deeper in their relationships you know, they're able to love at a deeper and bigger capacity because they can love themselves at a deeper and bigger capacity. I've seen people who are no longer people pleasers or don't talk bad about themselves or can advocate and use their voice and see it as strength, not hurting people's feelings. You know, all of these things that just pop up in life can be can be totally changed and 
it's just the best. <laughs> I'm like going through my little filing cabinet in my head <laughs> of all these stories and I just, it's so happy. It must be so rewarding for you to see those changes in people and also to have the results that you've had, you know, like to no longer just fall asleep randomly. <laughs> yeah, staying awake is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. Like that would be such, like, yeah, that's a whole podcast in itself is this this narcolepsy, seriously. <laughs> Trip, being tired all the time. Ooh. <laughs> now, you know, people are probably thinking, oh, how can I access this stuff, Renee? Like, there's so much within us. We've got what we need to heal us, right? You know, we've already got yeah. the tools. It's just accessing them and knowing they're there. Now, yeah. I would imagine things like meditation might be a great thing to use in this space. Am I right? Yes, you are right. I'm a big proponent of meditation. What we talked about earlier, it actually really helps with, which is, you know, you have to first become aware of where you are to make any changes. And there was a meditation practice that my yoga teacher had me do, um, you know, maybe a year ago or so. And it really shed light on things I didn't even know was there. And so what I would recommend for people starting in their meditation practice is to first know that it's not to not think, yeah. <laughs> you know, meditation isn't to shut your brain off and to just have it stop altogether you're going to have a wave of thoughts come up because it's likely the only time in your day that you're like not distracted because that's how we live these days. And so to sit down for five minutes a day, every day for 30 days, you can do that while your coffee's brewing, while your tea's steeping, you can do it while you're brushing your teeth, <laughs> whatever it is, five minutes a day, every day for 30 days. What this is going to do is it's going to show you that you can honor your word to yourself. So it will show you that no matter what, you showed up for yourself five minutes every day. And the second thing is I want you to write a sentence or two after every meditation with the theme of the thoughts that came up. For example, maybe you had a bunch of thoughts about the past or the future or a to-do list, or maybe you were going down one of those spirals of self-talk like, I'm not good at meditating. I must be doing something wrong. Gosh, I always do something wrong. You know, whatever that's like, write one to two sentences after every meditation for those 30 days. And you'll be able to see these themes that are present. And what it'll help you do is realize that your thoughts aren't fact. They're actually just a loop. So mm -hmm. it's the step one of bringing awareness to where you are. And then from there, you'll be able to tackle wherever you need to, whether you're in the past, whether you're feeling anxious about the future, whether you can't stop your to-do list from running, whether it's that negative self-talk, you can then take action once you know where you are. And it also brings you into the present moment, hopefully, you know, like we spend so much time in the past or the future that we actually lose the present moment. And I think that is one of the key benefits out of meditation. And, and you also mentioned there basically a form of journaling. Like I, I, I find so much therapy in that. Like, and I, I notice when I don't do it, like I'm like, mm, I really need to get back on that track. Um, but yeah. I love the fact that you bring up, you know, and this is a theme that's coming up in a lot of conversations I'm having lately is showing up for yourself. Mm, yes. It's, it's so important for us to be able to do and it's generally the first thing that we'll not do. Like if it's something that serves us, especially with women who maybe feel like they need to carry a lot of the load, whether it's in relationships or families or career, or, you know, they're juggling all these plates at once. It's the relationship with yourself, the well-being for yourself, the health for yourself that will, you know, maybe mm. do tomorrow, mm. <laughs> not today. Which is insane, my, right? Why do we do that? Like, like you're giving your power to someone else, basically. Like, why on earth do we do that? It's crazy. It's crazy. My, my challenge to anyone who also does that, that might be listening, is that you will be a better mother, a better partner, better for your corporate team. You'll show up better in your career if you take care of yourself first. A big one I hear with moms is that like they just literally can't because mm. there's little people that need them. Mm. And my challenge to that is that you are teaching 
your child how to fill their cup first. Mm -hmm. You are also balancing centering yourself so that you show up as the mom you want to do or show up as the mom you want to be, not be reactive or burnt out or tired or stressed. So it's a win-win when you take care of yourself. And I'm I'm hearing the word boundaries there, Renee. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> because that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is like setting boundaries for yourself and others so that you can actually take that time to put yourself first and show up for yourself. Ah, uh, you're so right. I'm a big fan of boundaries over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think boundaries need to be rebranded and they need their own PR team because, (laughs) because boundaries, boundaries are a win-win like setting boundaries shows, Hey, I love you so much. And I want you in my life. Here's how you win with me. Yeah. Like here's how we can win together. You know, setting a boundary shows somebody you want them in your life because you know, the alternative is just like cutting that off. Mm. (laughs) So Mm. the fact that you're setting a boundary should show you and them that that you love them, that and, the relationship's important. So like, here's here's how our relationship needs to be. It's so powerful too. Like if someone sees you put a, a boundary in place, they're like, oh, I can't just walk over them and get what I want. Totally, <laughs> totally. And it models the behaviours we want as well, right? Absolutely. Mm. It really does and it allows us to – really figure out what's right and what's not right for us. You know, I think with boundaries, a lot of the time, it's another big buzzword out there. And again, I'm glad people are talking about it. And I think people are missing a really important part when they're setting boundaries. And that's figuring out what actually is the specific behavior that is no longer acceptable. Mm. Oftentimes I'll hear, (laughs) for example, there was someone I was chatting with and they said, my boundary is that they can't talk to me like that anymore. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean they can't talk to you in that setting, in that tone, with those words around those people? Like, what is like that? Mm. They can't talk to you like that. Because as a boundary setter, you want them to win with you. So you need to be so clear yep. on what it is that's not okay. And I think that's the piece that's missing yeah, exactly. So, you know, you do work with students. Um, you were just saying you've just come from a, a session just last night. <laughs> um, like when you're getting into those sessions with people, particularly when they're, they're trying to learn new things and maybe, you know, perform, um, you know, different things using their mind, how do you tap into that, that higher level of performance that helps them perform way above others? It's a lot of work before the moment, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times in athletics and a lot of like high powered careers, people are like, what can I do in the moment to perform better? And really it's, it's all, it's everything you're doing before that moment. Mm -hmm. That's going to allow you to show up to that moment differently. It's the meditation, it's the breath work, it's how you manage your mindset. You know, a lot of pro athletes will talk about when they're, in a game and something doesn't go their way, they've done so much mental practice that, you know, what just happened isn't good or bad. It's just information that they can then use to make the correct play. Mm. And that's a practice like the meditation and the breath work and the mindset and your reframing so that when you get to that point, you, you perform higher because of all the practice you put in. Mm. And, you know, I talk about well-being and, and wellness so much on this show, but I think, you know, I like to think of it as a, a bit of a pie of which there are four pieces. And mm. so obviously our mindset is one of those. Our physical health is another. But mm. also spirituality plays a part as well. How do you combine that in the work that you do? Mm, it's so important. And I love that question. So what I had done previously was a lot of helping people in the mental and emotional bodies, Mm. you know, uh, a lot of the mindset stuff, the reframing stuff, 
uh, being able to regulate emotions, notice their emotions rather than attach to their emotions. Everything was kind of living in this body. And I found that that was really great at helping people goal set, figure out what they want, but there was a piece missing. And to me, it was the physical and the spiritual. And Mm. so I dove into a multiple yoga teacher trainings to really bring like a whole human approach to it, because you can't just say, here's my goal. I want to make a million dollars next year. And then just focus on the doing you need to also focus on the beingness. Mm -hmm. Like who are you being along the way? Because that's going to trickle with you and that's going to make a bigger impact in your life rather than you reaching that goal. And so really figuring out a good exercise I do in the beginning of working with clients is figuring out who do you want to be spiritually? Who do you want to be emotionally and mentally? And who do you want to be physically? Not just what do you want to do? Not the doing energy, but who is it that you really want to be? You know, I think... I think it's an important whole pie mm. <laughs> that needs to be that. Mm. And this is it. People, uh, when they're asked that, they don't know, do they? Or they just don't think about it. They don't even dive into the possibility of who they could actually be. Yeah, it's it's a little flip-flopped, you know, in our, our Western society is once you have that thing, then you can do what you want to do. And then you can be who you want to be. So once you have that degree, then you can do that thing, that job you always wanted. And then once you have all that success and from doing, then you can really be that person you want to be when you're 50, 60, 70 (laughs) and beyond. And really we need to like flop it on its head and figure out, okay, no, who do I want to be? Get so clear on that. And then now that I know who I want to be, what's that person doing? Mm. You know, your goals are going to be so much more aligned when it comes from being this. And then you can work on what is it that I want to have, you know, because it all is stemming from being rather than you're doing. Mm. An example of this, I hear a lot in the beginning of the year, maybe you do too. People come in with goals of like, I want to read 12 books this year, 24 books this year, whatever it is. But then when I ask them, do they see themselves as a reader? They say no, (laughs) you know, because it's like a whole new goal that isn't aligned with who it is they want to be or how they see themselves. So it's like, okay, let's work on getting you to believe that you're a reader, that you're curious, you like to learn more, all of this stuff that will help you easily your next day you wake up, be like, oh, well, I'm a reader. What does a reader do? They read 10 pages. (laughs) because I'm a reader. Mm. It makes all the doing so much easier when we're clear on who we're being. And this is it. You can truly design the life you want. And I know that sounds very simplistic in the way that I've just put it, (laughs) but you can, if you consistently apply action in the right places to get where you want to go. Um, There's a a good friend of mine in Canada who (laughs) often sends me TikToks uh, of things that are just like right on the money, just when I need to see them. And um, there's one from Oprah that has almost become like our mantra that, um, it, you know, it's almost like if you are going on a trip and you don't have a map and you don't know where you're going, mm-hmm. how do you know when you get there? You know, like if you don't see and know what it is you want and where you want to be or what you want to get to, This episode is brought to you by Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulated with 24 clinically and scientifically studied strains to support healthy regularity and your gut, immune, and skin health. Optimize your gut health. Visit seed.com slash Spotify with code Spotify for 30% off your first month of Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. How do you know you're there? You know, so Ooh, she and I have, have now done this thing. Okay, we see ourselves interviewing Oprah, so that's going to be happening. So stay yes! tuned. <laughs> Can't wait for that episode. <laughs> so it, it's it's like knowing and, and, and having that as you, you, you actually live in that vision in your mind. And if you can do that, before you know it, it's happening. It's happening. Mm. Totally. And mm. this is where manifestation plays a part too, right? 
Um, no doubt you probably talk about this a little bit too. Um, and there is a formula to it I have learnt. Um, and yeah. everybody's got their own formula that works for them. But I actually um, did it just as a practice earlier this year, might have been last year, um, where I wrote down exactly what it was I wanted to achieve, mm. clear as crystal, took all the actions to get myself there. Within three months, it happened. Yes. Wow. I love hearing those stories. So you've got to believe in yourself too. Again, we're coming back to these beliefs. Um, and yes. you, you've got to not listen to anybody else and all of their bullshit. And you've actually just Ooh. got to listen to yourself and trust yes. in that you can do that and keep going yes. towards that and nothing else. There is no other option. That is it. Uh, I love that. And especially what you just said about not letting anyone else sprinkle their bullshit on it. Yep. You know, I think so much in the society, we like to declare things, you know, it's like, I'm declaring that this is what I want and who I now am. And what we leave room for is people to, whether they're well-intended or not, they sprinkle their beliefs and their projections and their past experiences, whether it's with words or energy or like a mm. face, <laughs> whatever it is, you're like taking in their projections. And then what does that do to our beliefs? It's like, oh, that is kind of a crazy goal. Maybe I'll lower it, you know, or like, oh, that is silly to think I can do it. So I love that piece of just like keeping this little goal, this manifestation of yours so protected mm. and keep your mindset protected and keep your beingness protected and then watch it flourish. And again, it comes back to showing up for yourself. Because mm. if you don't take yourself seriously, how's anybody else going to do it? You know, yeah. you might say the most outlandish thing that, you know, you is so full of self-belief and other people are sitting there laughing at you. If you sit there and you listen to that laugh and you think that that's genuine, that's, that's going to make you unravel right there. Oh, you're right. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Now, Renee, you've been talking about yoga a bit. And I know that you do a lot of yoga. Tell us how that plays a part. The yoga <clears throat> really rounds out everything <laughs> to me. And, and I dove in for my own personal practice. I was looking for something. To me, yoga is really spiritual as well. I know it doesn't really need to fill that bucket for everyone. So for me, it, it connects the, the spiritual and the physical body. Like, so to me, it was the missing piece. What I see in my clients <clears throat> and with our students is that yoga is an opportunity to, it's another avenue to find our patterns and become aware of it. For example, if I lead a class and there's a really tough pose that I'm asking them to hold for a long time, it's an opportunity to see where does, what emotions come up in times of challenge where does your mind go? Are you like cussing your teacher out in your head right now? Are you wanting to quit? Are you wanting to dissociate and just come back during a comfier pose? Because what you do there is what you do everywhere. You know, how we do one thing is how we do everything. So the asana portion, the physical pose portion of yoga really brings everything up to the surface. <laughs> you know, there's no hiding from holding plank for very long <laughs> or doing this like challenging back bend. Uh, and then I do pranayama, like a breath work following that. And that allows us to, on a physical level, get our body into the parasympathetic nervous system by using a bunch of different breath work techniques. It allows us to, like you mentioned earlier, come back to the present moment. And then we go right into a meditation that allows us to strengthen and practice our relationship with ourself again. You know, are we able to see everything that's coming up and just watch it kind of go by and maintain our strength in ourself, which mm -hmm. is so wonderful when you're trying to make a goal come true. Can you watch all of the thoughts, all of the challenges, all of the everything that might be passing by and say, stay strong in what you know to be true so I find it to be a very holistic, I call it a whole human approach. You know, we're mm. looking at all the bodies 
And yoga is just a vessel to do that. Mm. And <laughs> you're going to laugh at this, Renee, but a few years ago, uh, a friend of mine took me into going to yoga with her and I'd never done yoga in my life. I said, this does not bend. And anyway, I, I, she said, no, come on, come and give it a go. Anyway, I went and I was surprised uh, like mm. uh, what I could do. And next minute my foot was near my head and I was like, oh, okay, this thing does bend. Um, <laughs> and um, what for me what it was is it gets you out of your head, gets you out of your head and into your body which I think is a big thing for a lot of people. They're so stuck in their head um, that they don't even realise their body half the time. Yeah, Mm. you're right. It definitely helps people come into their body and notice how does this, you know, how does your breath affect your body in this pose? How, what are you physically feeling in this pose without giving it story. Like, can you notice sensations that are there? Oftentimes it's the very first time people came into their body in that day, you know, cause mm. we're so buzzy. We're so distracted with all the stimulus around with all of our to-do lists, with all of our plates juggling that we forget about this like flesh carcass, <laughs> you know, and the more we can like unionize our mind and our body and our spirit, the better we can work as like a whole being. Mm. It's in- incredible. And Renee, again, I I think I could sit and talk to you all day. There's a million things that, <laughs> that we could pull apart here, seriously. But, you know, if, sure. pe- if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about what you do, where can they go? They can go to wearelovelove.com or they can go to my Instagram page, which is just my first name and last name, Renee Yomtab. Amazing. Got the last big question for you, Renee. What's the change you'd like to see in the world and how can we bring it to life? What's the change I'd like to see in the world? And how Mm. can we bring it to life? I would love to see people know how badass they are (laughs) just innately and how amazing they are and how many resources they have available to them. And How we do that is just continue to talk about it. Mm. So I appreciate this podcast and giving people an opportunity to hear about some positive change and hear that it's possible through all the guests you have on. I love that you said that because a lot of people call me a badass. Uh, 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 I have loved every single minute with you, Renee. Thank you so much for being a part of the ethical evolution. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution Podcast. If you're ready to be the change and would love to work with me on finding your voice through spiritual coaching or creating your own podcast with impact, visit ethicalchangeagency.com. Introducing the Deep Leadership Podcast. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. Rennie. As a former submarine officer who spent 22 years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Deep Leadership is real-world, actionable leadership advice from John and his expert guests. Become a leader worth following. Subscribe today. Electric acid. If you're looking for some of the best alternative rock. Three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. What's up? This is Brad. And this is Rob from Lincoln Park. Ninety-five, The Edge, powered by Autolist.com. Download the Autolist radio app from the Apple or Google Play Store and enjoy some of the best alternative punk rock and grunge from the 90s to today.